With Episode 3 giving us so much information and expanding the world of Ruby overall, Episode 4 is more of a follow-up episode, giving us a little bit about Salem's faction and showing Ruby's and Crow's reaction to the information that they just learned. So, to that end, this follow-up episode will make for a shorter review, but that doesn't mean that there isn't some information that can be gained from it. To that end, I'm going to say spoiler warning for those who haven't seen the episode just yet. I'm not going to be showing the episode or clips from it in this video. There is a link in the description to Rooster Teeth first, so you can go there, watch the episode, support the series that we all love. So the episode starts off with Team Ruby being understandably pissed off at Ozpin for hiding all of this information from them. In particular, the fact that they are fighting an immortal. Something that makes a very dangerous enemy. When you can't kill it, that means it could likely kill you. So... He could have at least told them that, not to mention a lot of this other stuff could have easily been told to them, because frankly, if they went to tell anyone else, they probably wouldn't believe them anyways. And upon Ruby asking Ozpin, do you even have a plan? Ozpin responds no and gets hit in the face so hard he flies into a tree. The one who punches him is probably the one taking the information the hardest, that being Crow, considering he devoted so much of his life to Ozpin. He even says that he was an outcast. No one wanted him. But Ozpin gave him a place, a purpose, and now he feels betrayed, meeting Ozpin being the worst luck of his life. Ozpin then locks himself in Oscar's mind, and everyone starts getting angrier, freaking out more, not knowing where to go from here. And the voice of reason ends up being the little old lady, Maria Cavera, saying that, you're all being very negative right now. You're gonna draw the grim. Which, frankly, I'm surprised the... Griffins that ran away from the train as they went into the tunnel and after the, um, what was it, the Sphinx was defeated, that they didn't just come back after all the negativity that they're giving off, not to mention they have the relic, which also draws Grim. It's weird that they didn't show up, but I understand from a storytelling perspective. So everyone starts packing up, Ruby goes to hand Oscar the cane, and Oscar is of course questioning whether he's just another of Ozpin's lives. Ruby trying to console him, saying, you're your own person, Crow already taking pot shots at Ozpin, saying, don't lie to him, we're better than that. We're implying that they're better than Ozpin, that they don't lie to their friends. Which, you know, makes sense, but kind of hurtful to Oscar, considering he's the youngest of the group. And frankly, from what we learned from episode 3, I think Oscar easily will be his own person. Because as Jin was saying, eventually Ozma learned to live with the soul that he was reincarnated in. I think when Ozpin first told everyone that he was continually reincarnates, he mentioned that he combines with the soul that he's reincarnated into, which I don't think is the case. It's only Ozma's soul that's cursed to reincarnate. The other souls, who were pretty much unwilling in this and don't have a choice, they live out their lives, granted altered by Ozma's presence, end up passing on at the end of it, and it's only Ozma that's cursed to reincarnate. I think, at least. Let me know what you guys think, if that's the case, or if I'm missing something along those lines. We then cut to the Dark Territory, Salem's Territory, which we now know the God of Darkness used to reside in. We see about five Nevermores on a cliff as a ship goes by, and the Nevermores do follow it, but they don't actually attack it. Now, my guess, Salem's sentries that she told to guard, but not attack the ships containing her troops. At least, that's my guess. And we see that the ship comes out with Hazel, Emerald, and Mercury. Now, my question is, is the ship on autopilot, or is there an actual pilot in and of itself? Because that could mm, provide some interesting information as well. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. They get out and are greeted by Tyrion, who, of course, is mocking them that they're missing a person. What, pray tell, happened to our fall maiden? Which, of course, drives Emerald a little bit up the wall. She turns on Tyrion, and Tyrion <clears throat> reminds Emerald that Cinder is no longer here to protect her, also showing a bit of a masochistic side along with his sadistic side, and freaks Emerald the hell out. Mercury pulls Emerald back, telling Tyrion to, you know, get the, get away, and then we see that Hazel is now reporting to Salem. And when Salem asks, what led to your defeat, Hazel goes into what happened at the actual battle, that the Faunus army, and Salem cuts him off there. No, no. Who caused your defeat? Who caused this plan to fail? And surprisingly, Hazel goes to take responsibility for everything. Then Salem literally flips the table, and the first time I watched this I didn't really notice, but 
Tyrion got flattened by it. Poor guy. Well, not really, considering his personality. He probably enjoyed it a little bit. But, flips the table, takes the Grim Arms out of the floor, pulls Hazel down, and pins him there. Now, I don't think he's suffocating, but it's gotta not be comfortable. She then turns to Emerald and asks her the exact same question. Very quickly, self-preservation kicks in, and Emerald turns on Cinder, just saying, Cinder did it. She was the reason we failed. Understandable, considering at that point, at that moment at least, she thought Cinder was dead and there would be, you know, no repercussions of it. Might be some later, because Salem just reveals at that point, good, you've admitted it. Cinder needs to stay in isolation and wait until she redeems herself. So Cinder is alive, as Mercury and Emerald now realize. Salem then goes into the speech that we heard back in the trailer of Volume 6. It's important not to lose sight of what drives you. Love, justice, reverence. But putting your desires ahead of Salem's means your desires will be lost to you. The only way to achieve them is through Salem. And so they must press on. So, as most people guessed, this was pretty much directed towards Emerald. Granted, at everyone in the room, but since she looked at Emerald before the speech, my guess is it was mainly there, in reference to Cinder's mistakes. And then Salem starts talking about the sword that's hidden under Vacuo, and mentions Shade Academy, which we know is the Relic of Destruction, but Hazel interrupts her before she can finish speaking, saying there's one more thing to report, that Crow and the kids are headed to Atlas, led by Ozpin, which Salem does not like to hear. She starts freaking out, the windows start cracking, darkness rises up around her, and she orders everyone to leave. Which they do, Emerald being the last, and as she's looking through the last cracks of the door, she looks terrified. Salem then erupts with anger and lets out a banshee howl, shattering all the glass in her throne room, boardroom, meeting room, whatever room that is, I'm guessing a combination of all of the above, but lets out the howl, shatters all the glass. And then it cuts back to our heroines, who are pretty miserable still, walking through the forest, wanting to just get this relic to Atlas. The weather's not letting up. Yang's even starting to rip into Maria, the old lady, about, you know, I thought you said trails led somewhere, and Maria's harping on harassing an old lady, which, the defenseless old lady, really driving that defenseless aspect there, which makes me think that maybe she's not as defenseless as she seems. Which is true, considering she walked out of a train that was just derailed, but again, something I've already mentioned, and we'll see later on in the series. They end up arriving at Brookshot Brunswick Farms, which is an abandoned farmhouse, and that's where the episode ends. Now, one thing I will mention about this farmhouse, there's, there's a building in there, the main building. For some reason, it just stands out to me. I don't really know why, but it seems familiar. Like, we may have seen it before. Whether it was in, like, a World of Remnant episode, I feel like there might have been a drawing of, or an outline of the, of the same house or something in one of the World of Remnant episodes, and that's why it seems familiar, but it just does for some reason. Anyways, now as for what we can learn from this episode, the first and foremost of which is that Crow is giving in to despair. With the information that he and everyone else learned, he is the one who has devoted the most time to the goal of defeating Salem, only to find out that she can't be killed, and that the person who has been guiding him has been hiding so much from him. He mentioned that he thought he was doing good. I would argue that he still was, because Ozpin was still trying to gather information on Salem. I don't know if he was actually still trying to find a way to defeat her. I'd hope so, considering that's his purpose and why he was continuing to reincarnate, but that's becoming questionable at this point. And Crow also mentioned that meeting Ozpin was the worst luck of all, meaning that he might be even blaming Ozpin, his meeting him, on his semblance of radiating bad luck. That the bad luck is affecting him to that degree that his entire life course that he has been following for the past decade, two decades, however long it has been, has been a result of his semblance that he's just in a bad state. And if that's the case, he's not going to be in a good place. He's be going to become increasingly depressed about this, that he's going to question everything, and I'm hoping that at least Ruby will be able to draw him out of this. In the opening to this overall volume, we see that Crow is being dragged backwards by the grim hands that we saw Salem summon earlier in this episode. And then later Ruby is fighting the same grim hands, so maybe that means Crow gives into the depression, Ruby 
ends up fighting it and breaking through it. Also, when Crow's being dragged backwards, the theme, or the song that's in the opening, says, Trust in the power that you have. For Crow, the power that he has is his radiating bad luck, which at this point he's probably distrusting a great deal if he's blaming meeting Ozpin even on that, that Crow has nothing but bad luck. But he needs to learn to trust it, that there is a reason he was created with that bad luck. There's a reason that he has been set on the path that he is on, and he still has good that he can do. I would argue that him... He has been doing good so far, as I previously mentioned, but we'll have to see what comes of that. It's going to be a downward spiral for the next couple episodes for Crow, at least, and it might lead to something in the climax, and I just really hope that Crow doesn't die at the end of this, but we'll see what ends up happening. Now, the second thing that really stood out to me about this episode was the fact that Hazel tried to take the fall for Cinder, and any way that I spin this, I can't come up with a reason why he'd do that. Because he's shown no emotion towards anyone this entire series, been completely indifferent except for his anger towards Ozpin. But that's a special case. Other than that, positive or negative, hasn't shown any emotion towards Cinder or really anyone else. So why would he try to take the fall for her? Especially considering at this point, I'm sure that Hazel, just like everyone else, thought that Cinder was dead. So even if Hazel was the reason that the plan fell apart, which he wasn't, blame it on the dead guy. Makes perfect sense. But considering Cinder was thought to be dead, and was actually at fault, why would he try to protect her? I mean, he could care about his comrades that much. I mean, when... Emerald started freaking out at the thought that Cinder was actually dead. He grabbed Emerald the first thing and booked it out of there, making sure that she was safe. So maybe he does care about his comrades that much. But if she's already thought to be dead, what's the point? Let me know what you guys think. If you guys have any theories on why Hazel would possibly do that. But I don't really know. But one thing we did learn, though, is that Hazel was the one in contact with the Spider Network that found out where Crow and the kids are and where they were headed he probably wanted something to report to Salem that would actually be useful and helpful, show his worth. But at least that's one mystery solved. Another interesting thing to note is that Watts questioned Salem. When she said that Cinder was alive, he turned and said, are you joking? How could you possibly know that? Of course, Tyrion correcting that real quick, it shows that Watts isn't as obedient to Salem as everyone else. He does like to question it and won't take things at face value. Now, as an easy explanation as to why Salem knew Cinder was alive, I'm guessing it's the grim arm that Salem gave Cinder. Because Salem can control Grimm over long distances. For example, the seer Grimm that Lionheart had in his office. She was able to control that to kill Lionheart from a long way away. So, assuming that, of course, is a Grimm that Salem created, her creating the grim arm, maybe she was able to sense it over long distances. Sense that it was still alive, even just that much would be enough. Because if Cinder was to die, the grim arm would probably disintegrate and disappear, as all other grim do. That's probably why Salem knew, but it's interesting that Watts questioned her. Another thing that I kind of liked about the episode is Mercury showed some sign of caring about Emerald. When I made a video previously about what's going to happen to Emerald and Mercury in the coming volumes, that they are probably going to leave Salem at some point. It's reinforced here with Emerald being afraid of pretty much everything that happened with Tyrion and Salem herself. It seems likely that she might try to leave at some point. And I'm thinking still that Mercury might go with her. Because he pulled Mercury back from Tyrion, telling him to back off. He was protecting her. And that was a little bit comforting to know, because I believe that there were a couple comments that, you know, Mercury might not leave even if Emerald does. But now I believe even more that he will. There's some hope for Mercury to redeem himself and, you know, maybe turn against Salem, because he's one of my favorite characters. I'd like it for him to continue on in the series, hopefully as one of the good guys. The banter between him and Yang would be very nice to see. We also learn about the next potential target for Salem, that being the Sword of Destruction under Vacuo. She mentioned Shade Academy, so that might be next on the agenda. So it'll be interesting to see if Ruby, or Team Ruby, actually makes it to Atlas, or if they're diverted from Atlas to go to Vacuo to protect it from Salem, get the relic first to get it away from Salem. I'd like to see that happen, and it kind of makes sense considering that 
having to go to Atlas, for Salem at least, would mean having to deal with the entire military. A lot more easy to go to Vacuo, and considering Sun's already there, he might find a way to get a message to Blake, which would divert them from Atlas. So, it'll be interesting to see if that happens. Another interesting thing is how pissed Salem got upon just hearing that Ozpin had reincarnated. I mean, she knew it was going to happen, but so soon? As Tyrion pointed out, upon hearing all this information, he questioned, so soon. Which made me realize, when one incarnation of Ozma dies, the other one doesn't have to be immediate. It could be days, months, even years later that he reincarnates, because he may not be needed at that time. Yeah, to try to figure out a way to defeat Salem and everything, but his soul doesn't immediately go into another body. It could take time. And the reason Salem is so pissed is because she had no reprieve from him. Knowing that he's reincarnating and came back so soon means that she can never forget him. The memories that they shared, the love and happiness that she once had that had been shattered and the pain that she now feels can never be forgotten as long as Ozpin is around. At least that's my guess as to the source of her anger, or maybe just that the thorn in her side won't die, but it's still interesting to note. And now that we saw Tyrion for the first time since Volume 4, we see that he still has the nub of a tail. I mean, there was a little metal bauble at the end of it, but I don't think that's gonna, you know, transform out into a tail or anything like that, so he still hasn't got his new tail yet. Though, I think this volume we're going to see what his new tail actually is. My guess is going to be something mechanical, since Watts is an Atlesian scientist. So, that's gonna be something to look forward to, and especially I look forward to considering I want to see Tyrion fight more. He's got such an interesting fighting style, plus insanity is always something fun to see on screen. And the last little thing I want to mention is Maria. We need to find out what this woman has been through and what her connection to everything is, because she, although she said, you know, I'm still trying to deal with the fact that this is humanity's second time around, the amount of information that was just dropped on her, on a complete stranger who apparently has no connection to any of this, it's odd that she was so unfazed by all of it. She was like, okay, you know what? All of you need to calm down and we need to get moving because we need to be safe. And she just absorbed all of this information. Sure, there's probably some questioning in her, but I'm wondering if she knew at least part of this. If she had been told this from her ancestors or someone who maybe knew one of Ozpin's previous incarnations and or maybe she's a descendant of one of the previous incarnations or something along those lines that she knows some of this and she's not as phased by learning all of this. That's why she was able to keep a level head and that's why she might be able to offer information to Team Ruby and everyone else in this volume or maybe later on in the series. But she has a part to play and I'm really interested in what that's going to be. But that's about all I have for this review, so let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. If Emerald and Mercury will actually leave Salem, how long everyone's going to be pissed at Ozpin, or if maybe he can't be forgiven at all. If he ever comes out of Oscar's mind, that is. And where you think the series is headed, whether it's to Atlas, to Vacuo, and who might be coming after Team Ruby this time, whether it's Tyrion, Hazel, or Emerald and Mercury themselves. Possibly all the above? Cinder as well? We'll see what happens in this overall volume, so let me know what you guys think. Thanks again for watching, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next video.